So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a little bit of background of AWS, where we came from. I was uh, an early Amazon employee, and before I left the first time, I was uh, running product for AWS. That was a bad person to put in that role, since I'm not a coder. Um, so I left, and, uh, and I rejoined the company uh, a few years ago when my startup was, was acquired. So I now work on the startup BD team. We work with accelerators, incubators, venture firms, et cetera. So we work with social leverage, we work with Double M, we work with Queensbridge, et cetera. So if you are one of those firms and we don't have AWS benefits set up for your companies, uh, come grab uh, one of us uh, afterwards. Or Howard loves getting email. So if you don't get my email written down before you leave, just yeah. email Howard and then he'll, he'll forward it to me. Yeah. So um, let's see which do I push here. So uh, just for background, AWS is now eight and a half years young. Uh, it was launched officially uh, March 14th, 2006, with a product called S3. stands for Simple Storage Service. Um, it's probably, it was the, the, the breakout product. Um, just as, and I was sitting in the audience doing some research, just to, because I didn't know the answer, and when we launched it, uh, the price of S, and this, this is important for you guys, because I'm gonna explain like the benefits of working with AWS, or benefits of the cloud. When we launched S3, it was priced at 15 cents a gigabyte per month to store your objects in the cloud. And you had what was called four nines of durability, 99.99%. Uh, Today, eight and a half years later, it's now three cents a gigabyte to store that same, uh, same data in the cloud. So you drop 80% in cost. And it now runs with 11 nines of durability. What that means is you can put, I'll get this right, if you put 10,000 objects in S3, we might lose one every 10 million years. And you know, so it's crazy, crazy stats. The point being, why this is important is we, we took the same approach that we tell startups to do. We, we got out with what you could arguably call, arguably call a pretty good minimum viable product. But over the last eight and a half years, we lowered prices. And I'll, I'll talk about that. Over, over the main platform, we've lowered prices 44 times. And that might be normal, and you might hear people quote the race to zero, et cetera. But you as, like, where, when before AWS and the cloud and a lot of competitors that are there now, when were IT companies lowering your costs year over year? And, uh, you know, now you have S3, you have reduced redundancy storage, you have Glacier, you have, you know, all this stuff that got layered on it. But it sort of started with one product that made a lot of developers really happy. And then uh, we iterated on it and listened to customers and, and, um, and you get the benefit of that as customers. So uh, that was eight and a half years ago, uh, to give some perspective on how big AWS is without really giving you any numbers or data, which is what we're good at. Um, so in 2003, Amazon was a $5 billion business. With 7,800 employees, we, you know, we had a lot of servers and a lot of data centers. This is a two-year-old stat now, but in November 2012, every day, we were adding the equivalent server capacity to the fleet, to the AWS fleet. And that's a two-year-old stat, so my hunch is it's gone in the right. It's, all that is to say is the, the, the scale that you gain the benefit from as customers or in, uh, is it's, it's really hard to imagine. And we take that, and that's what drives those cost decreases. It, you know, we, you're getting the benefit of our security practices in data centers. And we're doing a lot of things that you shouldn't be spending time on. Um, so uh, why are companies adopting the cloud? Uh, just for perspective, because it's a lot of why companies are adopting is sort of why we moved to it. Uh, in our first 10 years, approximately, uh, before we went live, uh, we got very good at building large-scale distributed systems, you know, running data centers. Uh, you could argue, uh, going back to Gregor's presentation on power, the power grid, this is utility stuff. You know, you think, and I, I, I hate that he's in the crowd because he could probably correct me every which way, but 100 years ago, companies had power, you know, they created their own power. They, they had power facilities. And then the, the, the power grid came, and that's crazy now. You just plug into the wall, you use what you need, and it's probably a little more complicated than that for big companies, but you get the idea. And that, basically, we look at cloud computing the same way. So if you take nothing out of it and you replace AWS with uh, Google, uh, I'd like to just say, well, you replace it, like, if you're not running in the cloud, it's, it, it's a confusing thing nowadays because uh, you get the benefits of being able to scale globally, scale massively, 
test things, turn them on, turn them off. Um, and so when we say what's the number one reason, price gets focused on a lot. But the true, the true, the number one thing that we hear and, and the number one reason startups like it is the agility that uh, AWS gives companies, the ability to really test a lot of things, um, spin them up rapidly. You know, one in a hundred, uh, Howard likes the percentages to be higher, but a small percentage of your companies are going to become the next Netflix or Dropbox, et cetera. But when that happens, you don't want to have to worry about scale. You want to have those servers being bought and, and available. So, um, I'll skip this slide, you know, the, the, getting rid of CapEx, you don't have to buy servers anymore, you can scale infinitely, uh, no undifferentiated heavy lifting. Like, basically let us take care of the muck, uh, or, or another cloud provider take care of the muck. Um, your developers shouldn't be doing this stuff. Like, uh, a good example outside of FinTech that we uh, used a lot um, was like uh, in Instagram. Now, I know they've been bought by Facebook and there's a move now, but I think when they were bought for the billion dollars, they had eight employees or 11 employees. They focused on what they were great at, the photo part and the, the filters part and the sharing part, and they let us take care of the, the scaling and the, the storage and um, you know, managing their peaks. So back to scratching our own itch. Uh, where we started this from is we basically, we started as a small company. We used to be able to get pretty much all the important people in the room to get projects done, and as we grew, we had the same problem that every company has, where we would have projects, and one group would need resources of another group, and we would basically be running into the same conflicts of getting them to prioritize doing our work. And so the idea about you know, putting APIs on these, on these services and building atomically is where sort of the genesis you can think of it is where AWS came from, leveraging all of the, the server background. And we solved we basically said, let's start putting APIs on things and getting small enough teams. Um, it's a quote, if you can't feed a team with two pizzas, it's too large. I think the problem with that quote is sometimes you have to see the size of some engineers. Um, but the idea being that you have very small teams, you, you separate them very much like you do with distributed systems, and you connect it via APIs, and you build and iterate um, on top of it. And that's, you know, if you think about uh, how or where it came from, at a conceptual level, um, that's, uh, that's uh, where, where we came from. So um, no upfront, I'm going to skip this. The 44 price cuts you get the benefit of. The top right one is probably most important for early stage startups. The, the key is you don't have to guess. You know, you, you basically, uh, in the old days, you would have a launch coming. If you're, I'll use a Tradier uh, as an example. They, built, they basically built an API for trading. They were up on stage earlier. You know, 10 years ago, Tradier would have to say, hey, we have a big launch coming, and we think it's going to be really successful, so let's go buy a bunch of servers. And then they'd either make a mistake. They'd either buy too many, and then they'd be sitting with you know, servers being 10% utilized, or they'd, they'd buy too few, and they're, they'd have a runaway success, and the site would be crashing. And again, if you remember the early days of the internet, that happened a lot more frequently. And so basically with software now, a tradier can auto scale. You know, they basically can provision exactly what they need, over provision a little bit just to make sure they can have peak spikes. But if something takes off in a, in a hurry, uh, they scale up, they scale down. Uh, a drastic example of this could be tax season. Um, or uh, we have a pretty popular case on the election, uh, uh, Barack Obama. Like, it's the perfect example for cloud computing. You start with nothing. You scale up to maybe the largest email uh, sending operation on the planet, uh, financial fundraising, et cetera, and you scale back to nothing. And that, that wouldn't have happened before. There would be a lot of wasted capex. So skipping, uh, you know, focus on your business and, and global reach. Again, not as necessary for most startups. You know, 90% might not achieve their vision. But for the few that do grow and grow massively, uh, you want to work with a partner that has the ability uh, to scale globally, even into China, uh, Singapore, Japan, et cetera. So relevant to the people in this room, I've been using a lot of startup references. We tend to spend a lot of time talking about the Airbnbs and Pinterests uh, of the world. But um, from a fintech perspective or financial services perspective, we work with the largest insurance companies, exchanges, banks, um, and startups uh, in the world as well. Only reason this is really relevant, other than some of you work for some of these, these large companies, 
is that startups get the benefit of the compliance work that we've done. We, you don't secure these workloads unless you have the people that have gotten the, the compliance and they've passed the security test, et cetera. And so you get to benefit and ride on, on that work. Uh, I'll skip, I mean, basically, people use us for everything. Everything from you know, uh, just doing testing, development environments, migrating their own apps over, building new apps, to banks that have gone essentially all in. I think, uh, I'm not even sure if that's pronounced Robico, but I know uh, some corp had the big announcement last year at reInvent where they just made an all-in choice. So the, the key is that you don't have to choose. You know, you can, we have some customers that will only use us for storage, whereas other customers that are uh, making wholesale migration. So um, lastly, uh, probably not gonna write this all down. We have a, a Scott had to leave. Uh, his email is ESM at Amazon. He runs our, he runs BD for our financial services uh, practice. Um, but, but we also have a team, Brad's right here in the middle. Raise your hand, Brad. Um, Brian's somewhere in the crowd. Brian? I don't know. In, in any case, grab us uh, if you have questions or if you can't grab us before you leave. If, uh, if, you, have, um, uh, if you, you have an application, you were looking for a physical, like a, uh, an actual person to interact with at AWS rather than uh, the site. Uh, we have people in New York City, Brad uh, and Scott work out of New York. Uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan's in San Francisco, I'm based down in LA, um, and we'll happily either come ourselves or get people hooked up um, to help you and your tech uh, dev teams uh, with uh, questioning how and how, how you can work with us, uh, what comparable workloads we have, et cetera.